and welcome to today's culture edition here on I-24 News. I'm Kali Von. Today on the show, we'll talk to the photographer of a series of portraits of African refugees in Israel. An exhibition charting the journey of Israeli art to modernity. And we'll talk about musicians persecuted for their work. Cholot is an open detention center in the south of Israel which holds thousands of African refugees. There's been an ongoing campaign in Israel to delegitimize these people who claim to have legal refugee status and whose claims have not been examined. Photographer Kobe Wolf went to Cholot and made a series of portraits of the detainees and he's here to tell us about it. Thank you, Kobe, for being here with us today. Hi. Hi. So tell me, how did this uh, project come to be? What prompted it? I was on my way to Cholot because I wanted to, to expose the story of these uh, refugees. I've heard about the camps, I've heard about the, the story of them. For me, it's like a jail. It's not, like, it's not only a camp. And I wanted to expose their story. And they were quite happy to, to cooperate with me. So you're saying that they, they weren't uh, startled by your, your camera. People were cooperative. They wanted to share their story. Uh, I saw on your website you've done many projects about refugees. Why is this a subject that draws you? Why is this something you want to shoot? It's because, uh, uh, I'm, because I, I'm a Jew, because uh, this, the, the story of the, of the Jews in the Holocaust, I've learned about uh, how, is to, how is to be re refugees uh, in a foreign country. And I went to tell the story, especially in Israel, especially in this country, to tell uh, the story uh, of um, refugees in Israel. And, uh, now, you said you, you chose to use a Polaroid-like Polaroid -like, uh, photographs for this project. Why did you make this decision? Because uh, at that time, it was a good idea for me to use a different format. Uh, I'm using uh, many kind of formats, uh, digital and film. And uh, at this time, I wanted to, I wanted to, handwriting uh, numbers just uh, in the bottom of of, uh, of the photos, because uh, at that time the government uh, used these uh, people uh, as numbers, just uh, as an animals, and uh, I wanted to show that uh, they have also names and not only numbers. And it was kind of. Uh, so you wanted to deliver their message in many ways, and the question is, do you think the message has come across to Israeli society, or is it just a, a, maybe a number of people or thousands who have been exposed to this? What do you think? Uh, I'm not sure about the... It seems like uh, it doesn't uh, come through the people in Israel so much. Uh, unfortunately, the people, some of the people in Israel are influenced by... Uh, by dark and, and ignorant people who sees these uh, refugees as a cancer, especially Knesset members, some of them actually. And, now, uh, you mentioned you're as a Jew and as someone or as a people who, who have been persecuted. It was important for you to uh, deliver the message and to show the story of other people who have been, yet the message isn't coming across as you say. Why do you think Israeli Jews have such a hard time empathizing with non-Jewish uh, immigrants. I think it's in uh, all over the world you can see that uh, white people are afraid of uh, black people somehow. It's very difficult to people to, uh, to accept uh, uh, foreign people in their, in their country. Uh, I've I have no explanation why uh, people in Israel uh, for, forgot the history of the Jewish in, in Europe, for example. But uh, just, uh, just like that, and, and not only the refugees are uh, suffering, also the Ethiopians, the Jewish from, from Ethiopia in Israel suffer too. How is this project different from previous um, projects, pre previous stories you've covered? You, You've covered different sides of political of the political map. Yes. You've covered uh, different uh, immigrations, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is a very big theme in Israel. How is, is this story of Cholot unique? 
it's uh, unique or connected? Exactly, and maybe it is connected. Maybe there's an overall theme. What maybe it is connected, especially by the the right wing members. Uh, somehow, just uh, as I've, I've told you before, uh, people are in Israel are afraid from the from from f foreigners, and uh, I, I'm afraid that they see the Palestinians and the refugees as a danger to the future or even now a Jewish state. So really you're saying it's a, a concept of belonging and not belonging, us and them. Yes. What would you like to achieve through these projects? Just to expose the story. This is my duty. This is my duty as a photographer to show the reality as it is, to show the reality to the people. And uh, they will decide what they, what they want to do. But yes. Thank you very much, uh, Kobe Wolf, for being here with us and for exposing this very important story. I hope a lot of people in Israel get to see it. Thanks. Thank you. Moving on, a new exhibition at the Tel Aviv Museum shows Israeli art's journey towards modernity. The exhibition's three parts presents a comprehensive historical narrative of art in Israel throughout the 20th century and into the 21st. Daniel Campos went there and brought back this story. A new exhibition at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, curated by Ellen Ginton, explains three different chapters of Israeli art that were born as a result of artists thinking out of the box. Early art in the land of Israel was mainly decorative and had a strong presence of religious themes. But the foundation of the Betzalel School of Arts and Crafts in 1906, along with the immigration in the 1920s of many Jewish painters fleeing pogroms in Europe, were to change the art landscape of Israel. It's a cross-section of Israeli art, uh, starting from the early 20s, ending yesterday morning. The first chapter in this exhibition is pioneering and national modernism. The 30 years which preceded the establishment of the State of Israel and in the first two decades of statehood until 1967, the terms modernism and avant-garde were an ideological justification to rebel against the rigid artistic currents by bringing in elements of abstraction and social realism, as co-inventor of Dadaism Marcel Yanko did in his painting Mahavara, Transition Camp. Nationalism can be seen in Moshe Matosovsky's Construction Workers from 1931, or in Ruben Rubin's The Zeppelin Ober Tel Aviv from 1929, and in neo-expressionist painting The Bride and Her Father from 1925. More naive art such as Pinchas Litvinovsky, Arab with a Flower, Arya Lubin's View from Tel Aviv to Ramat Gan Hill, also a reminder of the cultural and natural diversity of the period. The second section of the exhibition is dedicated to post-Zionist and post-minimalism, internationality and subjectivity, art from the 1970s to 1999. Here displayed are the works of the Israeli pioneer of geometrical abstract art Ehud Pekir, and a video construction series by Israeli artist Buki Schwartz, who was also known for his success in the New York art scene. The exhibit ends with the 21st Century, Reduction and Excess, a collection spanning the art of the 2000s, emphasizing on the trend of minimalism and maximalism. The themes here are diverse, history, politics, identity, as Nevet Yitzchak, a female artist from Eastern Jewish background, deconstructs the concept of Orientalism in her installation. And Yael Efrati's untitled, A Harsh Statement About Israeli Society. It is very typical for Israeli contemporary architecture, these walls, uh, which are to separate the world of the rich from the world of the ordinary people who are not to look into it. Nine decades of Israel's art history are likely to raise questions and curiosity about artists who are no longer alive and what would they think about Israeli contemporary art. I'd rather ask how would they feel about Israel today, about the use made of their slogans, their ideologies into contemporary politics in Israel. This is an exhibition that only requires patience and curiosity, and you will be rewarded with a non-mainstream narrative of history. 
gas lamps might bring to mind costume dramas and old Victorian novels, but the City of London still has 1,500 working gas lamps. Introduced to the city in 1814, a small team of London's last lamplighters continue to keep the yellow light going. More in this next report. As the sun sets over London, thousands of electric lights flood the city. But although the light pollution obscures a view of the stars, tourists and residents should still look upwards. And they may be surprised to learn that the capital still has 1,500 gas lamps, some dating as far back as 1814. The gas lamp is a much softer, more mellow lighting. It's, it, it's a calming light, uh, a nice soft yellow colour. And as opposed to the electrical light in the background there, you can see it's a much brighter, much more harsh light. So what the guys, when they come along, have to do? A team of just five lamplighters from British Gas maintain the lamps by hand. A mechanical timer controls the flow to these silk mantles, which light up off a pilot light, becoming white hot. The mantles are coated in lime oxide, and their early use in London theatres sparked the phrase, in the limelight. They clean the glass, replace mantles, and relight any pilots that uh, tend to blow out. The clocks, once they're fully wound, last for about two weeks. So they've all got about 300 lamps each to deal with. So by the time they've gone round, uh, come back to the original lamp, it's all ready to be uh, wound again. When the gas lamps were first introduced 200 years ago, they were a marvel of modern technology, bringing light and relative safety to London's dark and dangerous streets. An oasis from London's light pollution, St James's Park near Buckingham Palace is fully lit with gas. It's one of the few places that people can still imagine that Dickensian atmosphere. It gives you a bit of a feel of what it might have been like back in the, the 1800s when it was just gas that was lighting the streets of London. The gas lamps have survived the arrival of electricity and the bombing of London during the Blitz and they're now protected by English heritage. One V and the, and the crown here. Nowadays, the main threat is the traffic, and with vans and lorries much taller than horse-drawn carriages, many of the gas lanterns have been extended upwards. At a time when budget cuts have seen some councils switch off street lighting in some areas to save money, it seems these gas lights will keep on burning. And joining me now in studio is Daniel Campos. Thanks for being here as always. Daniel, what do you have for us today? Hello, Michal. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, two artists who are actually victims of oppression of freedom of musical expression. Uh, starting out by one in Cuba who was actually released, which is great news. He was in prison for two years. Uh, Angel Ramon, known as El Critico, the critic. And uh, he's been a big critic of the PCC, of the Partido Comunista de Cuba. And uh, again, he was in, in jail for two years. He was on a long hunger strike as well. And he's a rapper. A rapper. And uh, let's have a look at his yeah, music let's video. Let's hear what he does. So what is he saying? I'm guessing he was arrested perhaps for the content. Yeah, well, you know, you can see it's very edgy. He's attacking Castro while in his music video. You can see Fidel Castro archived footage of uh, executions uh, carried out by the PCC when uh, they took control of the country after the Cuban revol Revolution. Uh, very serious uh, stuff. And you can see, I mean, uh, two years in jail is better than, uh, than being executed for sure. Uh, but the man almost loses his life uh, after hunger strike. He's happy to be home, but still, he says Cuba is not free. He's going to continue pushing and fighting uh, for more freedoms. I'm obviously, his message. What, what else do you have? We have a Majid Derakshani, uh, who was. Uh, he believes that the reason why they took away his passport uh, at the airport in Tehran is because he included female solo uh, s singers in his music video, which of course is prohibited in the country. Should we take a look yeah, for a can moment? Have a look. Yeah, let's see. So Daniel, what is this all about? Well, you can see Majid is sitting with a group of women in a very relaxed environment. They're all at the same eye level. 
Uh, I would say the women also look relatively secular. They're not that covered, and they're all playing musical instruments. He's the greatest tar player. He plays an instrument known as the tar in Iran, and he's a big name. And he, like I said, he's being prevented from traveling and performing abroad, which is quite serious. And uh, I, I mean, I really admire him. He's a student of Mohammad Reza Lofti, uh, one of the late greatest masters of Persian classical music. And Hopefully, he'll get his passport back. I hope so. Indeed. Hopefully. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Thank you, as always, Daniel thank Campos. You, and thank you, our viewers, for joining us here today. You can join us again tomorrow, same time, same place. And uh, we hope you enjoyed our show. Thanks for watching. Thank you.